Hello and welcome to Stories of Scotland, a podcast where we are outlaws, following an ancient pony trail into the Scottish hills to see which goats we can steal. <clears throat> I mean, um, find and befriend completely legally. I'm Annie. Hmm, and I'm Jenny, and I've got my eye on you. There'll be no goat stealing here. Well, maybe a little. Or a lot. Or a societal way of life revolving around thievery that dominates for a few centuries. It's it's not it's irrelevant at this point. Because in this episode, we are talking about the Border Reavers. So this week we're looking at the Border clans, their families and feuds. As you said, we are going to meet the weird and wonderful Border Reavers. Well, it depends on which side of the reeve you're on, whether you think they're wonderful or not, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> And we've touched upon these border reavers in quite a few previous episodes and I have been looking forward to researching them properly for ages because I always thought that it was the Highlands that was considered the lawless area out of reach of the monarch's power. But in fact, the borders were just as bad, if not worse, and far closer to the monarch's seat of power in Edinburgh. Let's dive right into this reaver. <laughs> Right, it's, it's got nothing to do with water, but we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Just a quick thanks to our sponsors of this episode, Scotland Shop. Scotland Shop make beautiful tartan clothing with a story behind every product. And your tartan garments can be custom made to fit your body shape. While based in the borders, their tartans are available worldwide. Follow the link in the episode description and see their wide range of tailored tartan clothing and fabrics. There are over 500 clan tartans to choose from. 500! And you can make a virtual appointment for some personal service from the comfort of your own sofa. Your own sofa! Jenny, I think you'd look great in one of their tailored suits. I agree, Annie. I'll head over to Scotland Shop via the link in the episode description after the show. But for now, let's get back to the borders. From the 1300s to the very early 1600s, the borders were rife with reaving. The word reaving means to raid in Middle Scots, so a reaving party is a party heading out on a raid. The goal of the raid is to come back with as many heads of cattle, sheep and ponies as possible. Maybe a goat or two, why not chuck a few chickens in for luck, as well as any other valuables you can snatch along the way. So Annie, imagine it. You and your three brothers, seven cousins from both sides of the family, two uncles, father and a few close pals and all their brothers too. Meet by the fork in the burn as dusk closes in. It's a drizzly evening in early November. The heather has browned and winter is yawning. You all know it's going to be a hard few months ahead. The harvest failed again this year. Your father is leading the raid. He's been reaving for as long as he can ride a pony. And you all listen closely as he explains the plan one more time. You're to be heading 30 miles southeast. It's a long trek, but you know the land well even in the dark. Before long, the line of sturdy yet nimble Galloway nags, that's the lovely little ponies you're all on, is wading its way through the valleys and across the rivers. No one speaks. Everyone is focused on their own tasks. After a few hours, in the dim moonlight, you see the charred remains of a hamlet that was raised by the English army not six months ago. Abandoned, it serves as a signpost now. You're almost at your target. Tucked in the side of a hill is a fortified bastel house filled with Elliots and their livestock. It's an imposing building. Two storeys, thick stone walls, barely a window to see out of. It's built to keep you out. But the Elliots are a big family and they have a lot of livestock. Only their finest is herded into the lower level of the house each night. Before you know it, you're dismounting your pony and tethering her a few hundred feet from the pen holding the cows you're after. 
you adjust your metal helmet and thick padded protective jacket, your dagger is tucked securely in its sheath. Stealthily and quickly, you work with your cousins to quietly gather all the beasts together and herd them towards the ponies. But a cry rings out into the night from the Bastel house. There's no time for stealth now. You've been spotted. Whipping the cows into action, you mount your pony as the others tether the beasts together. Heart racing, you're off again. The farmer won't dare come after your party alone. It'll take him some time to raise the alarm and a group large enough to track you. There's folk waiting in strategic places on the route home. Now, it's just up to you to get the stolen cattle to them. The sun is rising to your right. A light mist is spiralling from the moor around you. Piece of cake. I mean, this sounds like an absolutely dreadful cake. <laughs> <laughs> You'll pay three times as much as it's worth or we'll chase you out with swords. <laughs> But why did these men mount their ponies and trail tens of miles through the night, risking their lives? What made the borders a land of outlaws and chaos? The Vivas' lifestyle has been heavily romanticised, especially by Victorians such as Walter Scott. But we have to remember that reaving was only a way of life because there was a genuine lack of any other choice. Reaving was a vicious cycle of being robbed, getting your land burnt, and then retaliating in the hope of stealing back something that is of equal value to what was taken from you. And this goes on and on in a continual and perpetual cycle of destruction. It was incredibly dangerous and forced most borderers, whether they were raiders or not, to be armed. People were aware of the constant dangers of living in the borders. The crushing devastation of waking up one day to find burnt crops and wondering how you would survive the winter. Many reavers were hanged or beheaded for their crimes. Many were killed while on raids or in the pursuits following them and a fair few were lost to the bottomless bogs and raging rivers of the landscape. But as Annie said, these men had little to no other choice. For 300 years, life in the borders was made increasingly difficult by a myriad of intersecting issues. Shall we get out our life was bad back then bingo cards, Annie, and see just how rough those in the borders had it? I'll get my special bingo pen. <laughs> Prior to the 13th century, the borders had a thriving wool industry. Sheep had a grand old time grazing in the rolling hills of the southern uplands. Their wool was transported down to the coast, particularly Berwick, and exported to Europe. From this, Berwick developed into a hugely successful port town, and the profits from the industry meant that there was plenty of money to support a healthy economy. With happy, jolly monks, the Grand Melrose and Kelso Abbeys were funded with this wool economy. And from the sheer size and impressiveness of these buildings, it's reflected just how much money was flowing through the borders at this time. Yes, Annie, but the current derelict state of the Melrose and Kelso Abbeys also reflects just how bad things would get. See, being in the borders meant being wedged between two kingdoms, two often warring kingdoms, and Berwick, being such a wealthy port town, was a prime strategic stronghold. The Wars of Independence began in the late 13th century, and Berwick was quickly taken by the English. Here, it was cut off from its supply of Scottish wool, and the industry quickly spiralled into decline. Yes. So the Scottish Wars of Independence lasted several decades and the political landscape was incredibly unstable. The folk living in the borders were caught right in the middle of these Wars of Independence between Scotland and England. And so they found themselves a frequent target of English invasion. Crops and homes were routinely burnt, villages destroyed, and possessions stolen. 
Weaving was already on the rise during this time, and while we may sweep over it in a few sentences, these folks had to live through it. Day by day, year by year. And it wasn't just the unpredictable actions of warring nations that they had to adapt to. It was also the unpredictable actions of Mother Nature. In the early 1300s, there were some uncharacteristically cold years, which led to crop failures and the threat of famine. This was the start of what is now called the Little Ice Age. It's one thing to get the cold shoulder from the kingdom next door, but it's a completely different thing to get the cold shoulder from Mother Nature upstairs. (laughs) Yes, and this cold shoulder was a particularly vehement one. It saw temperatures drop all over the world. Winters became longer and colder, growing seasons became shorter, wetter, and far less predictable. And this climatic change lasted for hundreds of years. It just makes you realize the power that the natural environment has over our everyday lives. Yes, Mother Nature can really hold a grudge. And the long climatic change saw farmers in the borders trade in their plows for cows, as cattle rearing was far more predictable than the seasons. Now, not only do you have crop failures, fewer farmers and hungry people, you also have much more livestock ready for stealing. Okay, so far in our life was bad back then bingo, we have the wool industry collapsing, ding, decades of war, ding, political instability, ding, an endless and hard winter, ding, famine, ding, poverty, ding. I mean, what else could possibly go wrong for the border folk? The plague! Ding, 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 ding! (laughs) Oh no. Oh yes. It's the 14th century and here comes the old Black Death. And oh, here it comes again. Oh, and yep, there it is again. And multiple more waves came, killing approximately a quarter of Scotland's population. The records of the Scottish demographic of this time period are not very good at all. So it's really hard to narrow down the percentage of how many people were killed by this plague. But what we do know is that these poor people would have all been impacted and it just seems like they can't catch a break at all. No, they do not. And all the while, reaving is on the rise. Because just like in the 13th century, The 14th century is also rife with national warring, local feuding, power grabs, truces, collapsing truces, huge organised raids, scorched earth policies, and then, in 1513, Flodden happens. Okay, yes, the Battle of Flodden. At this time, Henry VIII of England was a young king who wanted to show his power and strength and so he declared war on France. But in that game of poker, France had a sneaky little Scotland up its sleeve. You know, the royal dress was so flamboyant back then that I don't doubt its capabilities to store a small country amongst its folds. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there was certainly enough room for the old allegiance in there. Ah. The old allegiance was a pact between Scotland and France, that if England invaded either of them, then the other would attack England from their vantage point. Essentially, this means that if England attacks Scotland or France, it finds itself having to fight on two fronts, dividing its army and making it very sad. (laughs) Right, so Henry declaring war on France got Scotland involved in the north and made England very sad. Yes. And tensions were already through the roof in the borders. We've had some really big raids in this time period, and it's getting to a boiling point that something has to be done. And so, Flodden. In 1513, James IV leads an army of 42,000 into England, but things went south for the Scots pretty quickly and it ended up being an absolute calamity and defeat. An estimated 10,000 died in Flodden, amongst them King James IV, and a large number of his Scottish nobility. The new king, James's son, 
who, just to confuse things, is also called James, is only 17 months old when he's crowned king. Did they have to make a smaller one to fit his head? Or was he born with the natural big head of a man who knows he's going to be king? <laughs> All that you're getting from me is an awkward silence. Wait. Annie, give them some more time to laugh because that one was good. They're still going. Those who are chuckling, this is a long one. <laughs> ah, a little longer. Okay, they should be done now. <laughs> it's all in the very long timing. <laughs> These events have left a gaping hole in Scottish society and politics, resulting in a huge power vacuum. And whenever there's a power vacuum, we start to see some smaller lairds and nobles coming into play and trying to grab a piece of the big power pie for themselves. Every lord for himself. And so, after two centuries of deteriorating living conditions on pretty much every front, being topped off with the majority of Scottish nobles being killed in battle, the atmosphere was ripe for some reaving. With families struggling to survive, a culture of fighting, thievery and deception developed, reaching a fever pitch by the 1500s. At this point, the borders were considered a lawless badlands. Neither the state nor the church had any control there. So wild were the borders that the Archbishop of Glasgow, Gavin Dunbar, wrote a thousand word curse excommunicating all reavers and it was to be spoken at every pulpit. Annie, would you like to hear a select few of these thousand words? I don't think I can stop you right now. Please excuse me while I get it on my pulpit. <clears throat> I curse their heeds and all the hairs on their heed. I curse their face, their eyes, their mouth, their nose, their tongue, their teeth, their neck, their shoulders, their breast, their heart, their stomach, their back, their womb, their arms, their legs, their horns, their feet, and every part of their bodies, from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet, before and behind, within and without. I curse them going, and I curse them riding, and I curse them standing, and I curse them sitting. I curse them eating, I curse them drinking, I curse them walking, I curse them sleeping, I curse them rising, I curse them lying. <laughs> I curse I curse them at home, I curse them away from home, I curse them within the house, I curse them without the house, I curse their wives, I curse their bairns and their servants who participate with them in their deeds. I curse their corn, I curse their cattle, I curse their wool, their sheep, their horse, their swine, their geese, their hens, all their livestock. I curse their halls and their rooms, their stables and their barns, their byres and their barnyards, and their vegetable patches, their ploughs, their harrows, and the very clothes and houses that are necessary for their sustenance and welfare. I can't believe he cursed the vegetable patch. I mean, imagine sitting down to eat a cursed turnip. <laughs> I curse your turnips, and I curse the soil that your turnips is in, and I curse the slugs that are eating your turnips, and I curse... <laughs> <laughs> and I curse any podcast made about this curse, and I curse all those who don't leave a five-star rating in a review of said podcast. <laughs> Back to the real curse, Jenny. And finally, I condemn them perpetually to the deep pit o' hell, to remain with Lucifer and all his fellows, and their bodies to the gallows of the burrow muir, first to be hanged, then torn apart with dogs, swine, and other wild beasts, abominable to the world, and their life gone from your sight, as might their souls go from the sight of God, and their good fame from the world, which they forbear their open sins aforesaid, and rise from this terrible cursing, and make satisfaction and penance. 
To me, this feels like Gavin Dunbar had to write an essay and left it right up until the last minute. And he's just trying to fill the word count by repeating things but making it slightly different. (laughs) (laughs) To be fair, you know, he's got like one hour and a half, two hour sermon to fill. He's had a rough week. He's not been feeling the vibes. He probably had some cattle stolen as well. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wow. What an angry man. (laughs) So it may surprise you, but this curse did not really do much to deter the reavers of the borders. In fact, it's likely more amusing than terrifying for them. Now, this is a reflection of the lawlessness and disregard for authority in the borders. Gavin Dunbar's curse was not the first curse that the Reavers had faced, and they actually seemed to hold these curses as a mark of pride. And this rolled forward. Just 20 years ago, in the millennium, a big boulder was carved with the words of Gavin Duncan's Reaver curse and it was put in the Carlisle Museum to celebrate. I mean, it shows that hundreds of years later, these curses are still bringing folks entertainment. I do think the Borders have a soul of rebellion. Yes, and I actually think there was some controversy over the stone because after it was um, sort of revealed and to the public, uh, lots of stuff started going wrong for the area, including their local football team doing terribly. Now, I don't know if that was the Stones' fault, Annie, but if I kept losing, I'd blame good old Gavin Dunbar as well. Imagine cursing the football team, but keeping it at a really local level. (laughs) And I curse your football team, and I curse the pies you have at (laughs) halftime. Through the medieval and into the early modern period, the Scottish and English rulers were constantly wary of each other. But despite the ever-present tension between the nations, which occasionally boiled over into war or simmered down into an uneasy truce, the lives of those who lived in the border marches were far more focused on the ever-changing local power dynamics than the national ones. In general, The Scots and English were as bad as each other when it came to border raiding. Although the English kept a much better record of complaints of Scottish raids than the Scots did, and so in historic documents it appears that the Scots were far more active in this cross-border reaving. But in reality, there was a near constant flow of stolen cattle, sheep and ponies both ways across the border. And most of the time, Those doing the reaving didn't care what their victim's nationality was. It was more complicated than that. The borderers' allegiances laid in their family names. There was little more important than your surname. So what are some of the traditional border surnames? Who are our reavers? Well, you've got the Johnstons, Selby, Armstrongs, Kerrs, Johnstons, Scots, Douglases, Grahams, Forsters, Johnstons, Turnbull, Humes, Maxwell, Elliots, and Johnstons. All these are classic border surnames. Well, Jenny Johnston, I think you might have missed Johnston. Oh, yes, the mighty Johnstons, how could I forget? You know, I read in a few places that they were actually the best looking of the lot. With the loveliest eyelids. Yeah, definitely the most symmetrical of the clans. <laughs> There are some similarities between Highland clans and border family structures, beyond their tendencies to live by their own rules. The border families are very connected and loyal to their family name. In the Highlands, we would have clan chiefs, and many of the border reaver families also had chiefs, often called headsmen or simply lairds. Although the structures of power in each family varied, some of the border families had no single leader at their helm. Yes, and when your family headsman was rallying up a reaving party, the target was not so much the English across the border, but who your family name had a grudge on. Or making sure you don't raid someone who is tied to your name or your ally's name by mistake. 
cross-border allies were as common as cross-border foes, and reaving was common everywhere. But it also wasn't as clean-cut as England versus Scotland, because the land on either side of the border was divided into marches, each side having an east, middle and west march. The marches were devised in the late 13th century as part of a truce between King Henry III of England and King Alexander III of Scotland. The treaty delineated the frontier between the kingdoms, whilst also creating a bit of a buffer on each side in a bid to control the already troublesome raiding. The buffer was split into the six marches, each with a warden or conservator tasked with bringing some law and order to the area. Good luck with that, buddy. So this treaty, this truce, was also where the laws of the marches were formed. These were a type of cross-border law that governed the areas of the marches. It simply means that people on the Scottish side of the border can make complaints to the Scottish march warden, and people on the English side make complaints to their English march wardens. These march wardens are responsible for investigating the crimes on the border, and if they find guilty parties, then they have to bring them to a trysting place where they answer for their crimes. And this system worked well if the wardens did their jobs correctly and in an unbiased way. But this wasn't always guaranteed. The warden positions on the English side tended to be filled with well-trained nobility, sometimes coming from the south. On the Scottish side, however, the position was usually filled by a more local noble, making them highly political positions. More than one family feud was fueled by the appointment of a rival to the warden position. All wardens were susceptible to corruption, and many organised and partook in reaving themselves. It was also legal to hot trod in the marches. Oh, I love a hot toddy. <laughs> hot troddy. <laughs> hot trodding was if you saw your cattle being stolen and driven off into the murky darkness of the moors, you had the right to raise a squad of men and go after your livestock, chasing hot upon the reaver's heels. You could even cross the border and reclaim your livestock in the other country. So you're able to pass between England and Scotland and still have the same laws apply to you, which was not practiced anywhere other than the marches. This would be dangerous, though, because reavers were armed and ready to fight. Yes. However, if you were worn out from a hard day of living in the 15th century and you found yourself sleeping like a baby during the night, only to awake and find your paddocks empty, then a cold trod was in order. For six days, you were legally allowed to track your pretty coos through the valleys and try to claim them back. But it was often too late at this point, as reavers were incredibly well organised when it came to dispersing spoils amongst family and allies alike, turning the hot trail as cold as a fresh drink from the River Tweed. The border families were known to put their allegiance for their name before their allegiance to their country. And these aren't just your immediate family members. We're talking large extended families. There would be endless flip-flopping, side-swapping, deal-breaking and feud-making between these families. Yes, and one of the most long-lived, deeply rooted and bloody of these feuds was between the Maxwells and the Johnstons. The feud began somewhere in the early 16th century, and we're not really sure why, but it soon erupted into a full-blown hatred. Both families lived in the Scottish West March and sought the coveted West March warden position and the power that came with it. The Johnstons were a smaller family and found themselves constantly outnumbered by the Maxwells and their allies. However, if a Johnston was appointed West March warden, this far strengthened their position against the Maxwells. Depending on which family held the warden position, the other refused to acknowledge their authority, leading to the West March becoming one of the most lawless places in the borders. In 1593, after decades of flaring feuding between the families, a horse was stolen from the Johnstons by the Crichtons, who were an ally of the Maxwells. In retaliation, the Johnstons killed 15 Crichtons, which seems a little extreme, but
but tensions had been riding high and the horse was the last straw. Outraged, Lord Maxwell amassed 2,000 men and lay siege on Johnston's Lochwood Tower. James Johnston, the headsman, caught wind of the incoming army and he could only muster 400 men on such short notice. But the Johnstons were seasoned reavers and hiding themselves in the forest surrounding a narrow road set up a classic reaver's ambush. As the Maxwell party travelled unsuspectingly down the bottleneck, the Johnstons burst from cover and charged ferociously. So sudden and violent was the attack that the Maxwells at the front turned and ran to the rear of their army. Panic broke out and the Johnstons capitalised again, pushing further and killing more, fuelled by the deep desire to protect their name. The Johnstons forced their enemies back into the village of Lockerbie. Here, they trapped even more of them in small streets and winding alleyways, and showing no mercy, slaughtered over 700 Maxwells. This is known as the Battle of Dreyfe Sands, and is one of the deadliest battles between border families to ever occur. And let me guess, the families accepted that things had gone too far, so they shook hands and made amends, never to steal so much as a turnip from each other again. Um, no. Tensions boiled over into the 17th century, until, in 1608, when the heads of both families agreed to meet in a bid to put an end to their destructive feud. In typical Maxwell Johnston fashion, though, things got out of hand and Lord Maxwell shot James Johnston. Oh. Twice. Oh. In the back. Oh, so no truce then? Yeah, no truce. But Lord Maxwell knew he'd paid dearly for this murder and fled to France. He stayed there in exile for four years. And upon his return to the borders, he was captured and executed in Edinburgh. And the feud was finally settled. And I am living proof of this, Annie. For my great-great-grandfather was born in the borders and his name was John Johnston. And he fell in love with and married a Maxwell. Now she was the last in her line of Maxwells and so they named their son John Maxwell Johnston. And this has passed on down through the generations until it's reached me and my siblings and we all have Maxwell and Johnston in our names. I thought that was because you went to private school. <laughs> no, Annie, that's when the second middle name comes in. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I think, Annie? Please tell me. You know in Milan, uh, when all the ancestors are looking down on Milan's progress through her life and the battles that she has to fight? I've never seen Milan, but why do you ask? Do you think your ancestors are just constantly warring up there? <laughs> No, of course not. There's only so many times you can lose your head. They're all probably just listening to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> In fairness, Jenny, knowing your family, I think your ancestors are more likely to be looking up at us than down from down from a nice cloud. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Hey guys. <laughs> That was good, that was good. Just a quick thanks to our sponsors of this episode, Scotland Shop. Scotland Shop make beautiful tartan clothing with a story behind every product. And your tartan garments can be custom made to fit your body shape. While based in the borders, their tartans are available worldwide. Follow the link in the episode description and see their wide range of tailored tartan clothing and fabrics. There are over 500 clan tartans to choose from. 500! And you can make a virtual appointment for some personal service from the comfort of your own sofa. Your own sofa! Jenny, I think you'd look great in one of their tailored suits. I agree, Annie. I'll head over to Scotland Shop via the link in the episode description after the show. But for now, let's get back to the borders. One of my favourite sources about the histories of the border clans are the border ballads. These are the broad collection of songs that describe both the history and folklore of the borders. 
We have some phenomenal stories here, from descriptions of real battles and great knights, medieval romances and tragedies, and of course, encounters with supernatural forces. The Border Ballads give us a great insight into the culture of the area. Yes, and I am a massive fan of Johnny Armstrong. It's the tale of a classic romantic outlaw. Yes, like Dick Turpin or Robin Hood, our Johnny Armstrong is a maverick anti-hero. This is a brilliant but quite a bloody story. The original of this ballad was published by Alan Ramsey in 1724, who explained that... This I copied for a gentleman's mouth or the name Armstrong, who is the sixth generation from this John. He tells me this was an ever-esteemed genuine ballad. Before we get into the story that inspired the ballad, I just want to highlight that the Reavers would have done some pretty bad, nasty things. The Reavers lived by their own code of honour amongst outlaws, and some people really did not like this, such as King James V. Now, I also don't want to diminish that a lot of kings do some pretty evil things too, and they have their own code of honour amongst people who have crowns and money. However, just because they have crowns and power, kings can also try to shape the world to their wishes, and James V wanted nothing more than to destroy the Reavers. Add to this that King James V had some difficult family dynamics going on, you see, his uncle was King Henry VIII of England. Yes, that King Henry VIII. And there was an awkward and incredibly fragile truce between Scotland and England in the early 15th century. And because the borders are a perpetual back and forth of plundering on each other's territory, you can see how reaver activity has big potential to dismantle this peace. We already mentioned James V earlier in this episode. He had a really rough childhood. He's the king that was crowned at only 17 months old when his father was killed at Flodden. So because he was a child king, the country was ruled on his behalf by trusted regents. However, James's stepfather betrayed his trust and did a kind of royal imprisonment of teenage James V. When James is eventually broken free of this, he is keen to assert his power, dominance and control over Scotland. And if James can prove that he has the full authority to control the lawless borders, then it's a big sign to the rest of the world that this king has grown up and he has got a lot of influence. I guess that the Reavers are always going to be a threat to the King's ultimate control because they are just such wild cards, with more loyalty to their family name than to their King, and living by their own laws, they can't be relied upon for anything beyond raiding, plundering and general destruction. But then, folks who live in the borders didn't have the benefit of protection by being part of the kingdom that other people have, because the borders have their own laws. So, if your king isn't protecting you from constantly having your cattle stolen, I can understand why you would choose a plundering path. Yes, our Johnny is the head of what has become an epic border family. The Armstrongs were one of the most prolific, powerful and lawless families in the borders. I really enjoyed researching them because the descriptions vary so much, from gallant and loyal to bloodthirsty lawless brigands. And to add to the romance of Johnny Armstrong, he's described as never raiding Scotland, only England, and never plundering his fellow countrymen. So from this perspective, Johnny considers himself loyal to Scotland. The Armstrong base was Gilnocky Castle in Dumfries and Galloway. This was a great strategic fortification, because it's on the banks of the Taras River. To the south and east of the Taras headwaters were great slopes, matted with spongy peat and treacherous swamps. The Armstrongs knew the paths through this land like the back of their weapon-wielding hands, and this meant that if they were ever pursued, 
their chasers would get swamp stuck while they could flee. However, the Armstrongs are not just your friendly neighbourhood reavers, they were said to have influence that was felt as far east as Newcastle. And by influence, I mean blackmailing and extorting folks to ensure that his men protect their cattle. And if they didn't pay up, then they would steal the cattle. So really, the influence is a sort of ransom situation. And Johnny Armstrong's excessive raiding had been upsetting some VIPs of early modern Scotland. For example, the Archbishop of Glasgow, the same Gavin Dunbar with his massive curses, excommunicated Johnny Armstrong because he felt the excessive raids would threaten the delicate diplomatic truce with England. I really enjoy that Gavin Duncan, the Archbishop, is cursing and shunning the Reavers because it almost implies before he's taking this action to excommunicate them, he's somehow condoned the Reaving. <laughs> I suppose, I mean, it would be a very long confessional for the Reavers. You know, forgive me, father, for I have burnt some farms, plundered some lands, and stolen multiple cows and an angry goat. And that was just on Tuesday. <laughs> These Armstrong Reavers feel a bit like a mafia family, don't they? Extorting people from almost the full length of the borders. Because it's a big distance between Gilnocky and Newcastle. They have a lot of territory. The Godfather. Godfather. The Godfather. Well, King James V is going to make John Armstrong an offer he can't refuse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I've never seen The Godfather, I'm sorry. <laughs> But James V has seen that the Archbishop and his wardens have little impact at quashing Johnny's raiding. The murderous anarchy in the borders really made the king's ears flare and eyes bulge alarmingly. Our young, impatient king stomped his well-heeled shoe and declared that the borders would be tamed. So we're going into 1530 here, when James V is... 17 going on 18, so he's taking on a big task. He's gonna assert his dominance over the borders. It's a very large ask. Didn't we have a discussion last week about how we were never going to sing on the podcast again? <laughs> James comes down on the border lords with all the teen spirit and angst he can muster making arrests, imprisonments and executions, all with a heavy scent of Lynx Africa in his trail. Oh, for our American listeners, Lynx Africa is the UK equivalent of Axe Body Spray, which was not available in 1530. For international listeners, Lynx Africa is a deodorant common amongst teenage boys and notoriously awful. Uh, to be fair, if they'd gone with the branding Axe Body Spray in Britain in the 1530s, would have been a sellout for sure. <laughs> well, instead of having to advertise deodorants with the smell of battle, they actually did just smell like battle. So, you know, that's what it is. Cool battle breeze. <laughs> cool steel. That's not bad. Gut slicer. <laughs> All right, anyway. <clears throat> James came up with a great ruse. He sent out a royal proclamation that he wanted to meet with the leaders of the borders, including Johnny Armstrong. He promised them that it would just be a lovely, innocent meeting, where they could drink ye olde ale and play ye olde Xbox. So our Johnny Armstrong was summoned to meet James V at Carlin Rig, where he genuinely had nothing to fear. If you can trust anyone, it's the king, right? The young, spotty pent-up anger king. It's actually quite charming in the ballad, this invitation. The king, he writes a loving letter, with his own hand say tenderly, and he has sent it to Johnny Armstrong to come and speak with him speedily. Surely, with a loving letter, Johnny Armstrong has his security assured. Well, to make it into more of a boy's night, King James then leads 8,000 of his troops down to the borders. Ah yes, I too enjoy turning up to a casual meeting with eight battalions behind me. Nothing like a little steel to help seal the deal. <laughs> I think that's, that's, some, that's some axe advertising you've got there. That's some Lynx Africa <laughs> tagline. 
8,000 men for one meeting does seem a bit excessive. But this was no ordinary meeting. This was a meeting with THE Johnny Armstrong of Gilnocky. Johnny turns up with 24 men, which some would say is slightly less than 8,000. The following events aren't well documented, but the story goes that there was an agreement of good faith between the King and Armstrong, but that one party wasn't in the mood for being good. Let's get back to the ballad. A note on the Scots language, Kinnan and Caitlin are just the types of meat that they're going to be eating. So Kinnan means rabbit and Capin means chicken. The Elliots and Armstrongs did convene. They were a gallant company. We'll gang and meet our royal king and bring him safe to Gilnocky. Make Kinnan and Capon ready then, and venison in great plenty. We'll welcome him our royal king. I hope he'll dine in Gilnocky. I think this is really quite sweet. They're planning a lovely dinner for the king, and they've planned their menu like it's going to be on Come Dine With Me. And they don't stop at the food. They also coordinate outfits. The ballad has tremendous fun describing the clothing, in particular the girdle that Johnny Armstrong wore to the meeting. And boy, is it a lovely girdle. Gotta look fly for meeting the big guy. Johnny wore a girdle about his middle, embroidered over with burning gold, bespangled with the same metal, most beautiful it was to behold. Unfortunately, King James wasn't impressed by any of this, not even the dashing girdle. (laughs) Away, away, thou traitor strang, out of my sight thou may soon be. I granted never a traitor's life, and now I'll not begin with thee. So, essentially, James V is ordering Johnny Armstrong to be executed. And Johnny pleads for the life of himself and his men for a few verses. And then, unfortunately, our outlaw plunderer has a wee whine that life simply isn't fair. To seek hot water frae beneath cold ice, surely it is a great folly. For I have asked grace of a graceless face, but there is nane for my men and me. Johnny was murdered at Carlin Rig. We all his gallant company. But Scotland's hurt was ne'er say we to see so many brave men die. I love how emotional this ballad is. It really just shows the national pride in people who rebel. Never did Scotland's heart so wail like the deaths of these murdering, plundering reavers. Yeah, and there's loads of different ballads on this event, and some of them go so far as to describe the scene of the crime afterwards, saying that James had Johnny and all his men strung up from the trees around their meeting point, which, I don't know, I feel is a really powerful image. It almost shows the unplanned nature of this event. James didn't go into it thinking he was going to kill Johnny and all his men. Because if he'd really wanted to, he could have made a huge spectacle out of some of the most famous reavers in the borders. He could easily have arrested them all, taken them to Edinburgh, and have them hung for the whole city to see. A spectacle. This is what happens when you raid. But instead, he doesn't. It's almost as if Johnny Armstrong goes in all arrogant and proud as a reaver. And this in itself upsets James so much, or maybe some bad words were spoken, and James being this young Anstey teenager that we know, orders them all to be strung up from the trees. In one version of the ballad, King James gets really jealous of Johnny Armstrong's clothes, and he says something along the lines of, this man thinks himself a king upon my land, I'll show him what I'm made of. And I just find it hilarious that there's multiple versions of the ballad where the clothes that the reavers are wearing are the reason that they end up getting executed. They just look too dashing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I wonder if he took his girdle afterwards. (laughs) 
This is one of those historic events that so much mystery and myth swirls around and all these border ballads really add to this endless pool of intrigue that comes from this event. So, although no one really knows the events or what exactly was said, it didn't end well for Johnny and his reaving family. In 1603, the death of Elizabeth I cemented James VI of Scotland as James I of England, and this joined Scotland and England by crown. The reign of the border reavers on the middle grounds between Scotland and England was over. The borders oftentimes found itself embroiled in national and international politics, while also balancing the intricacies of local power dynamics. It's important to remember that people lived there, either in or on the edge of war for centuries. Uncertainty and unpredictability of life drove reaving. And though, to look at it now, we see people doing horrible things to one another. Perhaps for the reavers, this was their way of looking after and providing for their families. Let's finish on a wee ballad. It's called The Border Widow's Lament, and it describes her plight. My love, he built me a bonny bower, and clad it all with lily flower, a broer bower ye ne'er did see, than my true love he built for me. There came a man by middle day, he spied his sport and went away, and brought the king that very night, who break my bower and slew my knight. I sewed his sheet, making my mane. I watched the corpse, myself alone. I watched his body night and day. No living creature came that way. I took his body on my back, and whiles I walked and whiles I sat, I digged a grave and I laid him in, and I happed him with the turf so green. Nay, living man, I'll love again, since that my lovely knight is slain. We a lock o' his yellow hair, I'll chain my heart forever mere. Oh, it's so heartbreaking. It's so sad. <laughs> but I think it really well portrays the high cost of the reaving life. Mm, absolutely. And there's so much we couldn't fit in this episode. But I'm going to be putting a few extra snippets of fun things that I found in my research onto Patreon. So if you enjoyed these stories of border outlaws, then why not subscribe to our Patreon to listen to more? Patreon is a great way to support Annie and I as we make this weird little podcast. We do everything in our spare time, but we'd love nothing more than to be able to put more time into it. And by supporting us on Patreon, you can help us on our way to world domination. So thank you to those who have joined us recently. Carrie, Shan and Laird Rufus the Cat. Meow. Amanda, James, Camille and Rona. Thank you all so, so much for supporting us. May your turnips always grow mighty. I like to imagine our Patreon supporters as being in the only turnip patch in the whole borders that Archbishop Gavin Duncan's curse did not reach. And this gorgeous turnip patch has really large, juicy, hard turnips and all of our patrons are the little fairies that kind of live in the big turnips. And the turnips have these adorable little chimneys on them so that the fairies keep nice and warm. And they can survive by making turnip soup that they eat out of little acorns. And it's incredibly adorable. That's, that's the people who support us on Patreon. Apart from Laird Rufus, who's obviously a cat. But he still lives in the magical turnip patch. But he's a real life-size cat, so our tiny fairy patrons can ride on him. Okay, okay. Well, you can all get turnip blessings if you give us a five-star review and rating on whatever platform you listen on. Or share us on social media. 
all these actions really help us grow and, as I said, move towards our goal of world domination. Or turnip patch domination. <laughs> Until next time, friends. Slanjava. Slanjava.